Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. We need to be fully loaded, full of the power of God, and not living these little selfish, self-centered, demanding lives. You know, this self-problem started in the garden. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. I'm not going to go there and read all of them, but, you know, Adam and Eve were having a happy day as long as they were doing what God asked them to do. And then the, the enemy showed Eve something that she didn't have and told her her life would be better if she had it, even though God had already told her not to have that thing. They wanted for themselves what God had not given them, and they put their own will above his. The devil said, well, this fruit is good. You're going to know more. You're going to be more like God. You know what the result was? They lost their divine covering. All of a sudden, they realized that they were naked. They tried to cover themselves, got into works of the flesh, and they experienced fear for the first time in their life, and they ran and hid. And I believe that's exactly what happens to us when we live with a bunch of junk in our lives that we know is not right. Now, don't misunderstand me. None of us can be perfect. Thank God we have a Savior. Thank God for forgiveness. I need it 200 times every day. I'm grateful for forgiveness. But what I'm talking about today is just continuing on in things that you know are wrong and not even working with God. I mean, it may take a while to get breakthroughs and things that you have real bondages in, but the condition of our heart is very important. God, I don't want to do this. I want to be what you want me to be. I want to behave the way you want me to behave. And then you study and you hang out in the right atmosphere and you, you pray. And I'm going to tell you, I don't think that there's any person in this building or anywhere else that can tell me that you are in bondage and you have obeyed God for 20 years and you are still in the same bondage. I'm sorry, but I don't believe that. I can't support that in the Scripture. I believe that if I am in bondage and I get in a relationship with God and not only just get saved so I can get some fire insurance and not have to go to hell, but actually want to live a life with God where I invite the Holy Spirit into my life, deal with me about anything in my life that is not what you want it to be. Come on, I'm calling for some people today to be ready to grow up and mature and be all that God wants us to be. Amen? And I got to believe I got the right group. If you weren't somewhat serious, you wouldn't be out here on a Saturday morning. And I know we got lots of people from all different walks of life and at all different degrees of spiritual maturity, watching by TV, but I'm just telling you that God has got a life for you that is so unbelievably amazing. I mean, you don't want to miss what God has got for you. I mean, the peace, the joy, the righteousness, the hope, the power, the good things that God wants to do for you. Don't be one of those people that just pushes the limits as far as you can and hope you just barely sneak in the back door of heaven. I don't want to still be in kindergarten when I get there. You know, Lucifer fell from heaven through self-will. Let's look at Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. How have you fallen from heaven, O light bringer and day star, son of the morning? How have you been cast down to the ground, you who weakened and laid low the nations, O blasphemous satanic king of Babylon? And you who said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of assembly in the uttermost north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. And here was God's response. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol and Hades to the innermost recesses of the pit, the region of the dead. <laughs> 
So we need to just understand that whether we like it or not, God is in charge. And if we do what he asks us to, we're going to be happy and blessed. And if we don't, we're going to miss something. We're going to miss something. I could have gotten up and walked out of that show. Now, I, you know, I realize that's a minor thing. But this is where I started with God. I mean, you hear my, all my little stories about putting my grocery cart back and doing all the little things that God taught me to do. And that was where I, I didn't get to go to Bible college, but I went to the school of the Holy Ghost. And it's that kind of, listen to me, it's that kind of intimate, personal relationship with God where even when you're grocery shopping or you're talking to people or whatever and you get a little nudge from God that that's not what he wants you to do, that just for his sake, not to be well thought of by anybody because most people aren't even going to know you did it, but just for his sake, you'll do what he asks you to do. And let me tell you something, you start to develop an intimacy with God that is precious in your everyday life. And I know these kind of things happen to you. They happen to me all the time. Let's just talk about hotel rooms. Most of you have stayed in one here probably. Well, did you take care of it like you would have wanted somebody to have taken care of yours? I hope so. You say, well, what are you talking about? We're paying them to clean it up. I didn't say you needed to clean it up and make the bed and all that, but here's an example. This morning, I dropped a lid off of my coffee, and I didn't drop it in a convenient place. It went beside the chair, almost back behind it, and I reached down there and picked up my lid while there had been some water on it that got on the wood floor, and, you know, just momentary, I thought, See, we always have two things going on at once. It's, you know, God saying one thing and the flesh saying something else. So it was just that momentary. And then I thought, no. So I went and got a paper towel, had to hang upside down, get behind the chair, wipe the water up. It's those little things. I'm telling you, it's those little things that mean so much to God. I really believe that that's where we grow and mature more than all the things that we, I would rather see somebody make a commitment to do that than make a commitment to leave home and go to Africa and be a missionary. I would rather see somebody that will make a commitment to do the little things that God asked them to do just for him, things that nobody's ever going to know about but him, but you do it just for him. Amen? All right, now. Luke chapter 18, verse 18. I'm going to read you a story about a man that was a religious man, but not God's man. I want you to pay attention to what I just said. We can be a religious man, but not God's man. Luke 18, verse 18. A certain ruler asked him, good teacher, you who are essentially and perfectly, morally good, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? That is, what shall I do to partake of eternal salvation in the Messiah's kingdom? Verse 20, you know the commandments, don't commit adultery, don't kill, don't steal, don't witness falsely, honor your father and your mother. And he replied, I have done all of these from my youth. This guy kept the law. He was a good religious man. And when Jesus heard it, he said, well, there's one thing you still lack. Sell everything that you have and give the money to the poor. And you will have rich treasure in heaven. And then come back and follow me and be my disciple. Join my party and accompany me. But when he heard this, he became distressed and very sorrowful because he was rich, exceedingly so. And Jesus, observing him, said how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to enter through the needle's eye than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, well, then who in the world can be saved? And he said, what is impossible with men is possible with God. And, and listen, and Peter said, I love this, and Peter said, 
Well, see here, we've left our own things, home, family, business, and we have followed you. And he said to them, I say to you, truly there is no one who's left houses, or wives, or brothers, or parents, or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive in return many times more in this world and in the age to come eternal life. Now, that's a lot of verses, but let me, let me back this up and tell you what I've learned about this. Here's this guy who followed all the law. You can go to church, you can have your bumper sticker, you can give in the offering, you can usher at the door. We do so many things just because of the guidelines and the rules and they're what we think that we should be doing. And that doesn't even mean that we have bad hearts. But now Jesus comes along and he said, because, and Jesus didn't, he wasn't trying to take all the guy's money away from him. When you read people that scripture about giving away all that you have to the poor, it's just like. Argh. Jesus really wasn't just trying to take away all of his money. He knew the guy had a problem with his money. And so he asked him for it because he knew that his money was standing between the two of them. So sometimes God will have to rattle us in an area that means a little bit too much to us. There's a little shaking that goes on to see if we have to give that thing up, would we give it up if we had to for the sake of God? And if the young man would have done it, Jesus told his other disciples who said, well, we've given up this, this, that, and something else, and what about us? And he said, you never give up anything that you don't ultimately get back a lot more in this life and in the world to come. So I cannot even imagine what this guy would have ended up with if he would have done what God asked him to and said, it's yours, God. If you want it, the money's not, not as important to me as you are. If you want it, here it is. I mean, that guy would have gotten back so many times more with joy. But it was, he kept the money he had with no joy. So we can hang on to this thing that tickles our flesh and we can keep it and have no joy and have this heavy feeling inside or we can sacrifice and let our flesh hurt and then, the, then end up seeing what God can really do for somebody who's willing to give it all for him. Now, in Luke chapter 10, there's another wonderful story. Actually, Luke is a great, great chapter in the Bible. It's just got so many wonderful things in it. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. And a certain lawyer, now this was an intelligent man. <laughs> so we just dealt with a religious man who wasn't God's man, and now we're going to deal with an intelligent man who wasn't very wise. And a certain lawyer arose to try to tempt him, saying, Teacher, what am I to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Well, what's written in the law? And he said, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength, and you must love your neighbor as you do yourself. Well, the man wasn't wanting to do it, and so he pressed in a little more, and he said, Well, who is my neighbor? So then Jesus tells this story about a man who was beat up by robbers and he was thrown over on the side of the road and was bleeding and dying and a religious man came along and passed by on the other side of the road. Actually, a priest. And then another religious man came by, a Levi, and he also passed by on the other side of the road. And then just kind of a plain old ordinary guy <laughs> came by and he stopped and went to the man, took his own money, took his own time, took care of him, doctored his wounds, took him to an inn, which would now be a hotel, 
and told the man there, look, I've got some business I need to go do. He went and, but I'm gonna, here's money. Use this to take care of him. If I owe you anything else when I come back, I'll pay it. He didn't even put any limits on what he said he would do, and I love that part. He didn't say, well, I'll spend $22.50, but no more. He said, whatever it takes, I wanna help this guy. Man, whatever it takes, I wanna help this guy. Whatever it takes, I wanna help people. Whatever it takes. Is anybody home in the house? Whatever it takes, I wanna help people. If we want God to take the limits off of our blessings, maybe we need to take the limits off of our giving. I wonder how many people come to something like this and maybe you give an offering on Thursday night and so then each of the other offerings you think, well, I don't need to give again. Well, maybe you don't need to, but you can. I'm giving every time. I don't come in on Friday morning and say, I preached last night, so I just don't think I'll preach again today. <laughs> you know? If you go to a restaurant and eat four times, you can't say, I was here two nights ago, I'm not gonna pay today. <laughs> come on. <laughs> Thank you. So I just decided that I was gonna make up my own story. I'm kind of proud of this story, I thought this is good. Jesus told the story about two religious men and one compassionate man. I'm gonna tell you a story about three church attending Christians who were confronted with a need and how they responded. Three church attending, Bible reading, song singing Christians all knew a woman whose husband left her with four children whom he no longer supported. He found another younger woman left and never looked back. The woman was exhausted most of the time from trying to support her family and be both mom and dad to them. She was terribly lonely and very discouraged. Christian woman number one, in considering the lady's plight, said, I will pray for her. And that was a good religious response. Christian woman number two said, I wonder what she did that made her husband run off with another woman. <laughs> it had to be something. Well, all religious woman number two did was offer her opinion, but still no help. Christian woman number three saw the situation, prayed about how she could help. God gave her the idea to pay the woman's rent for a month and she decided to do so even though it meant she couldn't buy the new outfit she'd been saving money for. <laughs> he also gave her an idea to start regularly encouraging the woman and to become her friend. Now I ask you, which of these three do you believe was walking? and love. You see, this is really what it comes down to. And in just the last few minutes that I have here today, I just wanna say to you, you have one life to live and you have one life to give. Are you gonna give it to yourself? Or are you gonna give it to God and let him use it for whatever he wants to use it for? Are you gonna be... <laughs> And I would like to make a suggestion today. Many of you probably saw the movie The Bucket List and that's become kind of a thing, you know. People ask me all the time, do you have a bucket list? I said, yeah, but it's still empty. <laughs> I... You know what, to be honest, even though sometimes I do get tired of working so hard, I can't really think of anything that I'd rather do. I mean, I've tried living to make my own self happy. And I mean, I do things I enjoy and, you know, we're, God takes good care of us, but it's just like, I decided I'm gonna have a new bucket. And so I got a suggestion for you today for a new bucket list. Start a bucket 
And don't fill it with things you want or have to do before you die. But fill it up with things that you want to do for other people before you die. Amen. I love this. Let's get a new bucket list. Well, Lord, I would like to put a smile on three faces today. I want to be an encourager. Someday I want to buy some woman that hasn't had any new clothes in five years a whole nice new summer wardrobe. Really? Well, that took a while. I guess we better just start this message over. <laughs> Why don't you believe God to just be able to carry around a wallet full of $20 bills or $50 bills just so you can bless other people. How about, uh, how about carrying gift certificates for gas, for groceries, for different things like that, and just when you go into church, be a Holy Ghost spy? Come on. Just look for that single mom that you know it has to be tired because you've heard she's working two jobs and her husband doesn't pay child support and she probably never gets to take her kids out to eat. So why not just give her a nice gift certificate and say, hey, why don't you just take your kids out to lunch today? I mean, that can be like the difference in somebody giving up or going on. Come on. There's no reason for us to be bored and miserable and lonely and sitting around murmuring and complaining all the times about our lives and I, God, what's your will for me? What's my ministry? What's my call? What do you want me to do? Just start saying every time you have a need, see a need, God, is there something you want me to do? <laughs> Not God, you fix this, but do you want to use me to do something to make a difference in somebody's life? I'm telling you the truth. I've went from being guilty of all those things that I read in the beginning. That was me. If you want to be miserable, here's the way to do it. To actually getting up and purposing to live the way I'm, now I'm not there yet, I'm not arrived, but I'll tell you what, I think it's the best idea that I've had in a long time. <laughs> and I believe it will increase your joy, I mean, in a mega way. Amen? Come on, give God a big praise. This community likes boys, so they want their boys to go to school first. The girls, they don't have any, any value when it comes to education for them. So if they can get some money for her and not have the burden of having to care for her, it helps the family. The flags that you see on the homes over my shoulder represent a long-standing tradition that is very difficult on girls. As soon as a very young girl reaches puberty and she's of childbearing years, you'll see these flags above their houses representing the fact that a young girl is available to a man, essentially on the market, up for sale. And at that point, her life changes dramatically. So what they do is they take him out of school 
and they'll actually go through different activities, teaching them how to cook, how to be a, a wife in the, in the home. But part of it is also how to please a man. And that's through, you know, normal things in the house, but also sexually. So they teach them different things about sexuality and so on. So we are doing anything that we can to help people understand the value of girls. That's the key. And helping these girls by taking them into a program <laughs> called Imagine Hope. If they would live with us for six months and we would have devotions, lead them to the Lord, really mentor them in how to be a godly woman, and then at the same time teach them how to do some skills, basic things like jewelry making or whatever it is, that they can have some kind of an income that they can bring to their families. This is a good hat. Were you afraid when you thought that you were going to have to be married? Some of my friends, they are already married now, but they are used to suffer in that marriage. So if myself, I was afraid to be married while I'm still young, but because of this program, my mom, she didn't take me to the marriage, but she bring me here so that I can proceed with my education, so that I can help her in future change our situation. I, I'm so grateful. I wish I could bring everyone here and let them see the impact of what's happening. Um, and I'm grateful for it because we should give and we should give to those that we don't benefit us. And I think that's what Hand of Hope does and, and we're grateful for that. We are helping young women like this all over the world. Help us to guide, restore, and love young girls. Your designated gift today, if you choose, can go to Project Girl, or you can give toward water, you can give toward feeding, and do something that you know will make a difference. And so I'm inviting you to join us in partnership. Help us glorify God and share Christ. Help us help hurting people. Help us feed the poor and get the gospel to people that don't yet know what we know. You can check us out on JoyceMeyer.org and find out all that you need to know about partnership or you can call the ministry. God bless you and thank you for praying about this. Elk gebed en elke donatie telt. Samen veranderen we de wereld. Werk, huishouden, vrije tijd en nog veel meer. Het moederschap is een fulltime uitdaging. Groeit alles je soms boven het hoofd? Krijg weer rust, zelfvertrouwen en vreugde die dieper gaat. Laat je inspireren door Joyce Meyer, zelfmoeder van vier kinderen. Je hebt het verdiend. Het boek van Joyce Meyer, de zelfverzekerde moeder. Bestel je eigen exemplaar nu via joyce-meyer.nl of telefonisch via 026 2022 100.